Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. This is a talk on uh, deep learning using EEG for prognosis in uh, REM behavior disorder, also known as RBD, um, based on EEG uh, data and more completely in EEG spectrograms. Uh, my name is Julio Ruffini. I work for Neuroelectrics and also Starlab, both companies based in Barcelona and also in Cambridge uh, in Massachusetts. So the uh, content I'm going to be talking about is going to be mostly about a paper um, that we posted a few months ago on precisely this uh, this topic, and uh, I would like to acknowledge the collaboration of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, the funding from them, and as also the data availability which was provided by the team at the Center for Advanced Research in uh, Sleep Medicine in Montreal and the Hospital de Sacré Cœur de Montreal, uh, and the team of Jack Montplaisir. And Alfonso uh, Gagnon as well. So, uh, the starting point for us is uh, always the electric brain. Here you have a picture of cortically map EEG data uh, filtering the alpha band. And uh, I mean, ever since we started working, I started working in this field, I've uh, been convinced that there's a lot of useful information that we can extract if, you, if we only knew how the means to. And even though I started thinking about this about 20 years ago, I think it is only now that with new, new mathematical tools and algorithms, we can actually start digging into this seriously. Uh, in the, the context for which we do this uh, is actually the development of transcranial and EEG combined uh, uh, brain stimulation systems and EEG monitoring systems with the idea to uh, try to extract information from the brain and then stimulate it back uh, in, in uh, certain pathologies, and we are very interested in uh, things like epilepsy, and also in understanding better and getting biomarkers for uh, neurodegenerative disease, which is a topic of, I will be talking about today. Um, there is uh, um, increasing interest in developing neurobiomarkers, um, first for, the, for diagnosis, but also for prognosis, and also for follow-up to understand the disease progression. And uh, ideally, these uh, neuromarkers should be extracted with something that is um, cheap and easy to use. And from this point of view, we could do something with EEG, which I think we can now. Um, it's much better than if you have to do a PET scan, which is uh, expensive and, and invasive. Um, so in EEG, we extract data from multiple channels of, of EEG. Uh, they can span from anything from one to 256 channels, and then applying first signal processing to pre-process and, uh, and uh, clean up the data and prepare it. Then they can be passed on to machine learning algorithms, and then trained, and these algorithms can be trained uh, to recognize different states and give you indications for, as I mentioned, prognosis, which uh, is my, my focus today, or for, or for diagnosis or for follow-up. And EEG itself is a very interesting uh, measurement that you can extract from, from the brain because it's a very high time resolution. Um, and it gives you a direct uh, measurement of the actual physical processes by a physical process that are ongoing in the brain uh, as it processes information and as it functions. So it's quite a direct measurement, I think, um, compared, for instance, with metabolic type of, of measurements. Okay, and it's, all, it's obviously quite inexpensive compared to other means, non-invasive, uh, can be quantified, and in principle is quick and convenient, can be deployed in many places. Um, so the topic today is about REM behavior disorder, uh, which is um, an ailment that affects older adults, um, and that it's, uh, it, it appears as a parasomnia, which means that it's a disease of, of, of sleep in which people typically act out their dreams uh, during REM. REM, as you know, is the period of sleep in which you, um, it's, a, it's classified by uh, rapid eye movements and in which you're actually dreaming. Um, so people who are affected by this disease um, or this condition, let's say, they act out their dreams, they move a lot, they can actually, they are actually often reported by their partners because they, they can be violent um, and they can be injured by them. So in the data set that we were lucky to, to have access to, thanks to the work at Montreal, um, we have a data set of people who went uh, at some point to the, to the hospital and they had an EEG taken and their only symptoms were REM behavior disorder and they didn't have any other uh, symptoms of, of say Parkinson 
or um, um, Louis Boyd in uh, dementia or um, etc. Any, any kind of these pathologies that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, what happened is that after follow-up, 80% uh, uh, of these patients developed, uh, typically develop uh, a, a disease, um, which is um, mostly Parkinson's disease or um, dementia with Lewy bodies, and the two of them are actually uh, part of the same class of pathologies. Now they're recognized as synucleopathies, and they are, um, and, and we know now that people who develop these symptoms, um, thanks to recent data, it's becoming clearer and clearer that when you have this condition, it is highly likely that you will come out um, with, um, with one of these uh, um, pathologies. Uh, so um, dementia with Lewy bodies is one of them, Parkinson's, and multi -system, uh, multiple system atrophy is the other one. So the problem, uh, now that we have this picture of uh, RBD being seen as a stage in synucleopathy, is to try to classify, uh, to understand, to prognose what will happen um, to these people. So uh, in, in, in the classification task that we'll be discussing here, we have um, mostly the, the task to understanding of which people will, will convert to PD after having been diagnosed uh, as RBD. And the input data is EEG data and uh, the technology is machine learning. So we have done some earlier work in this area, um, mostly using um, classical shallow classifiers like support vector machines and feature selection. And this, I left there some papers that we, we have um, already posted before this. I, I will be talking about mostly about the deep learning stuff here. One of the things that uh, one observes in these groups and um, are um, uh, quite a big change in the spectrum of the EG. This is a spectrum where you have in the horizontal axis the frequency of, the oscill of, of brain oscillations. And in the vertical axis, you can see the power. And what is uh, clear at, uh, from this picture, which is a group level average, is that um, you have something called uh, slowing of EG, which basically means that uh, first, you tend to see more power at lower frequencies with respect to higher frequencies as, as disease um, appears. And um, also, actually, the peak frequencies that are taking place at the, at the, low, at the lower frequencies shift, shift uh, down. There is a slowing. Um, so this is one clear picture that one can start uh, to look at if you, uh, to do machine learning. But um, I would also emphasize that this slowing is, is not unique to this, um, to, to synucleopathies, but also, for instance, to Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. So this, the slowing of EG is quite a wide uh, biomarker in itself. And uh, by, uh, by looking at the power distribution in these bands, uh, one sees that there's this kind of step, step, um, staircase type uh, structure in which as you go from healthy controls to our people diagnosed with RBD uh, to those that have progressed to PD or to um, dementia with Lewy bodies, um, there is a worsening um, in this slowing. There's also a topographical distribution in the scalp which I, I posted on, on the bottom. So by using support vector machines, um, we typically to find after a lot of feature selection efforts, um, which can involve either a spectrum or coherence measures uh, across channels, um, you can get up to, uh, in the best cases of an AUC, an area under the curve of about 85%, in the simplest problem, which is healthy controls versus people who will progress to PD. Uh, so just to remind you that when we say here PD, it doesn't mean that it's a person diagnosed with PD. It's a person who has been diagnosed with RBD and who will eventually, after a few years, convert to PD. So, um, so in the top row, um, you, you can see an example of how well you can do actually by using all the information from the data to uh, do a statistical filtering, and it's kind of a best case scenario that one can get um, after a lot of work. So 
uh, here I would like to discuss now the deep learning stuff. So uh, the first question is why do this? Um, I think that people are understanding now that deep learning is really a step, it's a qualitative step forward in the field in the sense that we are no longer dealing with uh, shallow classifiers, but we have this notion of compositionality of features that can be that can be accessed by these classifiers, and that are much more powerful than um, than, the, than the traditional ones like support vector machines, which can be seen as shallow classifiers. Also, from the point of view, one thinks a bit more about Turing completeness. If you go from uh, feed-forward deep networks into recurrent neural networks, one can actually achieve Turing completeness, so which is a very powerful descriptive um, descriptive programming uh, ex uh, repertoire that these RNNs can achieve, and that probably explains why they are so difficult to train as well. And, they are, and another reason is that the brain is actually processing data in a compositional manner in a hierarchical organized way. Uh, it's basically a big complex recurrent neural network. Um, so trying to decode information from it using recurrent neural networks or at least deep networks is, is, a, is a natural thing to do. So um, um, although the future is, is surely in the recurrent neural network field, uh, RNNs uh, are for the moment a bit untamed yet compared to feed forward networks. But there is uh, some, some, um, some architectures that and techniques to, to start doing this I will discuss in a second. So if you're interested in the topic of shallow versus deep uh, net, network um, learning and deep learning, uh, this is a very nice paper that you can, that you can take a look at. And if you are more interested, I have another post or paper on, on, the, on the comparison between these approaches and why, why I think uh, they're so important, also from the point of view of algorithmic complexity, but this is a different matter. So one of the first things we did is to use autoencoders. Uh, this is this paper here uh, that is listed on the top by, by Eleni Krupi and, and, uh, and our team in Barcelona and, and others. And here the idea was to just use autoencoders to to actually extract uh, from the hidden, from the middle layer, extract some um, compressed features and use them for classification, which actually showed to be useful. Um, and it was the first thing that uh, using deep learning can be a, a step forward because um, it can help you with the feature selection. In another paper of, uh, of a couple of years ago, we uh, used a technique called um, echo state networks, which are a form of RNNs. Um, so the difference between feed forward and RNN networks is in this picture here, in which you can see on the top, uh, feed forward network in which information flows from the left to the right. It doesn't ever uh, feed back into any early stage, as opposed to recurrent neural network in which there are arbitrary connections that can provide access um, to pass data for any processing or um, steps. So it's, uh, this is what actually can be seen as a Turing complete uh, processing system. The problem is that they're very hard to, um, to, uh, to train. They have issues with back propagation. So one of the interesting things that was proposed by, by some researchers is the called, field called reservoir computing. And uh, here the, the strategy that I will discuss is that one can actually focus on training only the output weights of the system and leave uh, the internal weights of a very large network, for instance, a thousand nodes, um, and let them uh, be randomly wired and fixed, and then only focusing on the output. Um, so here's a more detailed picture of the, of, of the echo state network that, that we used. We have a, a series of inputs, which are a time series of band power. Uh, from different channels. There are some connections, uh, weight in connections into the network. Then in the middle you have the recurrent network which fix, fix weights. And then the output is uh, it's, uh, it's computed from um, the outgoing weights, um, which are actually the ones that are trained in the system and they, they can be trained easily. Here's a, an example of the activations of the hidden nodes in the middle. Um, this is a case with 100 nodes. And um, this is a, a type of uh, feature um, expansion that, that, that the systems do. Um, more concretely, you have here 14 channels of EG at 256 hertz uh, from a few minutes of data. 
these are data preparation step, uh, artifact removal, quake check, annotations, um, the extraction of sequences, um, and then the computation of band power at one second, uh, one second intervals. And in the bottom, you can see a graph of the of the time series of this power. And the, the idea is that hidden in this time series, which looks like a very noisy signal, there is information that can tell you if this comes from a patient who is a healthy control or is from an RBD patient that will convert uh, into PD uh, in a few years. Um, um, and this can be done for different bands, uh, from the lower frequency to the higher frequency bands of PG. Um, okay, I'm not going to go too much into this. One thing to note is that we didn't, in, this, in the study, we didn't carry out an extensive uh, selection of input channels. Uh, so we basically used those that were indicated to be good from earlier analysis without further, further research. This is something that, that should be done probably. Um, and here's an example of what you what you get. So on the bottom, um, the output of the system is trained to tell you if it's a healthy control or a Parkinson's patient by outputting my plus 0 0.5 or minus 0 0.5. And this the training lines are the solid lines. Um, and the and the output of the of the system after training um, is the red dots. Um, so you can see that in a training set, it's doing a pretty good job after training and in the tested in this particular case on the bottom, it's also doing well and, and um, it's confronted with a time series with a few uh, cases of um, healthy control and PD and it's shifting its state uh, correctly across the, uh, the transitions. So the results were, were encouraging, even though this is a computational intensive paradigm, and also uh, one of the shortcomings it has is that you have to select yourself the features you want. Um, um, but one question that one can also ask, is it actually using temporal information uh, to make decisions? And the answer is yes. If you start shuffling around time, the time steps in the signals for training, um, then uh, the system cannot predict uh, it stops being being functional. Okay. So now about this uh, paper with deep learning um, in the deep convolutional neural network and uh, RNN point of view. The idea here is to uh, not work with features uh, by selecting bands, but actually working with entire um, uh, spectrum and in fact the idea is to feed into um, a convolutional network um, images and the images are actually images of the spectrogram and there's another technique which is called bump analysis in the field uh, by a researcher called Vialat and others which was inspiring for this another source of inspiration was what people do in audio um, in audio analysis so you start from a spectrogram and you have an image so this seems something that could be useful to try with um, networks which have uh, um, which are actually optimal for for uh, um, for image analysis like deep convolutional neural networks so for each channel in the system uh, in the z direction there you have um, a bunch of frames because the spectrums are generated with some sliding windows and you also have for different EEG channels and what we did is to uh, try different architectures. Um, in, the, in the A plot, you have an architecture uh, for a, a feed forward convolutional network. We ended up using a four layer um, uh, network. Um, and then I also show a shallow one uh, that we used for comparison. And then the D plot uh, refers to a deep recurrent in our network, a set of stack LSTM or GRU cells. And I will discuss in a moment. So anyways, to tell you the story short, we got uh, pretty good accuracies and AUCs in this, with this paradigm. Um, and I think um, what was especially encouraging is the fact that we didn't do any feature selection and they, were, they seemed to be working uh, pretty well, even if using um, a few channels or even one channel of EG, which was uh, very, very surprising. We use a leaf per out uh, um, method uh, to, to compute AUCs and so on. 
The other thing that you can use uh, a train convolutional network is for deep dreaming. Um, so what we did here is to use the train network and to um, have it generate images um, that were supposed to look like a healthy control or or a healthy or a or a person with PD. And this is a very interesting way to try to understand what the network has learned, what it's using for classification, and in this case, um, using a, one of the electrodes on the on on the problem of healthy control versus PD and DLB converters. Uh, and we saw that it was paying a lot of attention to alpha bursts in, in the healthy control to, to, to think that a person is healthy control. He was happy to see that you have these 10 hertz alpha bursts. And instead, if you have uh, the, uh, or you will develop disease, it's uh, more likely that you will have some slower bursts at six to eight hertz. And the difference between the two is displayed at the bottom. So I think this is a nice way to, to break the, the black box uh, uh, problem with uh, deep learning in this case uh, and try to understand what it's actually paying attention to. Very shortly, the same thing can be done uh, actually with RNNs. So you can actually um, use a recurrent neural network in which you feed uh, row by row on uh, the image uh, the image data as a time series. These are the two different uh, architectures that we tried, the STMs and GRUs very nicely described in the um, in this blog post at the bottom. And actually we stacked them. We, we had to stack them. Uh, um, we ended up using uh, three 16 unit cells of G GRU or LSTMs. The performance were very similar. We also found that it was a faster way uh, to, to run, to run uh, the algorithms. The performances were similar. So uh, on the bottom, you have uh, the deep convolutional neural network. Um, you have here the subject scores for each subject. There's a subject ID in the bottom, which is not really important, but it's just ordering uh, subjects by, by their score. And the ones that are blue are healthy controls, and the orange ones are the, the ones um, that would develop PD. And um, you can see that the deep convolutional neural network does a nice job. There's one outlier, uh, which one uh, can wonder if there is maybe a problem with the data itself. Um, but the LSTM and GRU performances are very similar. So, so in this in this in this uh, presentation, I've given you hopefully a flavor of um, first the problem at hand of prognosis in our in RBD. Um, and why EG can be useful for it, and also have discussed um, deep learning methods starting from echo state networks, autoencoders, and then um, deep convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks, stack neural networks that can be used for uh, for processing um, actually spectrogram like data uh, with uh, mitigation for feature selection. And uh, while well, the results were an improvement over our prior attempts with uh, techniques like support vector machines that also required um, extensive filtering methods. And of course, future work will need to extend these findings uh, into, lar into larger databases because um, to actually exploit deep learning well, you need a lot of data and it's something we're working on now. Uh, thank you for your attention.